So the idea for this talk really、uh, came from our past few years of Eric and I sharing our experiences teaching. We both teach at two-year and four-year institutions, and,、uh, and you know, and we we both start our careers at、uh, at a four-year institution. I've been at Florida Atlantic University for 20 years, but、uh, a few years ago, we we both started moonlighting at our at our community college. In my case, is because I was spending my summers in Las Vegas with my parents. And I thought,、right, well, let's do something different. Let's let's apply to the local community college out there and start teaching a course. And that led to you know a recurring opportunity for me to teach regularly、uh, at that school. And so we really, what Eric and I really shared in common is that we both have adapted our you know our teaching techniques and strategies since we started teaching at a two year college. In some ways, we in some instances we've taken what we do in our large, you know,、uh, large auditorium classes at our four-year schools, and we've sort of brought those techniques to the community college. But more often than not, it's our experiences working with the two-year students and how that has informed us in in changing the way we approach our larger four, our classes at our four-year universities. So this presentation is is a, a summary of what we believe is our five biggest. Lessons that we've learned teaching at both types of institutions, and and how we've、uh, adapted our teaching methods to try to reach more students with different backgrounds and with different circumstances that we you know that we've、uh, encountered over、uh, over the years. And this is also very important, especially as many schools now have much more emphasis on DEI, on diversity, equity, inclusion, on trying to、uh, help instructors,、uh, you know. Engage in different types of course design to reach out to more students. So I think this is all、uh, very relevant relevant to what many, many of us are,、uh, uh, you know, some of the challenges we face today. So to summarize where we teach, Erica is a professor of instruction at University of South Florida in Tampa. She's also an instructor at Santa Barbara City College, where she teaches、uh, online, both asynchronous and synchronous courses、uh, out in California. Uh, for myself, I'm the associate director and the director of instructional technology at Florida Atlantic University, a four-year public、uh, institution in Boca Raton, Florida, near Miami. And I'm also an instructor at the College of Southern Nevada,、uh, which is in Las Vegas. And this is our typical course load in a typical semester.、Uh, Erica teaches her very large class at USF with 420 students this semester. She also has a small face-to-face -face class. As well as、uh, her honors and non-honors classes that are online at Santa Barbara City College,、uh, myself, I have a very, very large lecture capture class where I have students in a room about this size, but it's also live streamed、uh, to many, many more hundreds of students, and that's at Florida Atlantic University. I also have a small face-to-face -face section, mostly honors students, and then I have my uh, uh, synchronous online course at the College of Southern Nevada. So all four of our schools share. Similar demographics in that we're we're a very we have very diverse institutions. You know that's expected being near Miami and Southern California,、uh, and we also have very high percentage of non-traditional age students. You know students that are、uh, starting college, you know years after they、uh, finished high school.、Uh, but the biggest difference between our two-year experience and our four-year experience, our teaching experiences, is definitely the class size. You know teaching a, a 600 student class versus a 25 student class. Also, the, we've, what we found is that the, the backgrounds are very different. Like in many of our two-year students, they are working full time. They have other obligations. They have families,、uh, and they have、uh, many have significant gaps from the time they finished high school from the time they started college. So these are some of the challenges we as instructors、uh, are faced when we are,、uh, you know, just trying to reach out to as many students as possible. So the first example I want to share is、uh, how do we identify what the students' goals are? Because Eric and I both teach at business schools in our in our four year institutions. So the vast majority of our students are business pre business majors. They have to take our courses. They're trying to get through both micro and macro. Whereas in our two year institutions, many students are taking our course by choice as a general elective. You know, so they're not business majors. They are、uh, often they're. You know, again, they, many have significant gaps in their education, and they're taking our relatively technical course without necessarily having the the, the same backgrounds is the preparation as some of our four year students. So the first goal for us, we learned, is we really need to identify what the students' objectives are. You know, what are they trying to accomplish in our course, or why are they even in college? And so, using the discussion board is something that we've you know we've always done, having students introduce themselves. 
But we never really tried that really in our large sections because you know, it's, it's kind of impractical having a discussion board with 500 students. Uh, even, if you, even if you break them down into smaller discussion groups, it's still a lot of students to be able to grade and, and manage. But a couple of things is that once I started getting involved more with um, online course design and quality matters, which is my, my talk tomorrow, uh, in quality matters, standard 1.9 says you have to have your students introduce themselves in some way. Right. Even in a large online course, you have to have students introduce themselves like, OK, so I'm going to start using uh, discussion boards in my 600 student class. But the challenge is, is then I want to respond to as many of these introductions as possible. You know, and so at our two year institution, sure, 30 students send a personal response, send some career advice, some you know, suggestions on majors, trying to be trying to be personable to make you look like a real person and not just not just someone who prepped a course once and launched it, you know, asynchronously. So, you know, having students see you as a real person really goes a long way in, uh, in helping them stay engaged with the course. And so the, the lesson I learned here is that even in a very large section, even when you have hundreds of students, just responding to a few, for example, the students who posted in the discussion board early, by responding to them personally, Subsequent students who then look at the discussion boards are seeing that you're engaging with some students directly. And that's and that really goes a long way. It's like, oh, you know, the professor is actually seeing what we're writing, responding to it. And in some cases, if we see a u very unique situation, you know, I had a student that said, you know, I've worked my entire life, never got a college degree. I'm back in your class. I uh, don't remember algebra. I'm going to be very, very worried. So I immediately take notes and start reaching out to those students directly. And it's like, you know, I, I understand your situation. I'm going to, uh, this course is going to be challenging, but we're going to help you uh, get through it successfully. And we're going to find some paths for, for success. Okay, so that's the one thing we really learned when we started teaching at the uh, two-year level is that how to really reach out to students and understand what we're trying to achieve. Okay, so the second lesson that we learned is uh, really coming from a four-year school where we have certain... Uh, you know, certain expectations of what we're going to be covering in our principal's course, and then trying to maintain that rigor, you know, at, at the, at the two-year level, while still understanding that many students are facing, uh, you know, uh, different circumstances, right? They've worked full-time, they have families to take care of, they have the significant gaps in their education. So there's a challenge of maintaining that rigor in the classroom, but at the same time, providing multiple opportunities to for students to show their proficiency, for them to uh, create different paths for success for them. And so that led us to really think about how we structure our courses, you know, in that we have elements of our course which are based on participation. We have low stakes assessment and higher stakes assessment. So even if we maintain all the different activities we use in our you know, in our four-year institution as our two-year institution, there's ways you can make the weights of the assessment, uh, weights of the assessment a little more flexible. So for, so for example, uh, both Eric and I put a much greater weight on participation in our, in our two-year schools because we want that greater correlation between a student's effort and their performance. So for example, Erica requires her uh, students to submit notes every week, okay, just as a way to give credit for staying up with the course and not, uh, not falling behind on, on watching the lectures or keeping up with the material, and a bunch of other activities which you can give full credit for students for participating. And then there's low stakes assessments, such as the many, many activities in Achieve, which we both use. So you can assign tutorials, lecture videos, uh, learning curve activities, just various ways to get students practicing the content and getting some credit for it. But then Obviously, it comes down to the higher stakes assessments, which are important as well. But there are some concessions that you can make as well, again, in different circumstances. For example, what happens when you have a student who struggles through the semester, failed the first exam, but struggles, 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 but then gets it, you know, gets a respectable score on the final exam? Do they deserve to fail? Because, you know, they got 75% of the final, but they've struggled all the way through. One way to correct that is to give an incentive to have that final exam count more by replacing an earlier score. And that way you're not penalizing you know, the, the fact that some students just simply took longer to get to the point where they understood the material. 
Okay, so different techniques like that, like uh, you know, counting, waiting the exam, final exam more, allowing students to review their errors on the exam and perhaps resubmit their exams for partial credit. There's different ways that you can create different opportunities for students to uh, to succeed, and that's really what we uh, uh, learned a lot from 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 our experiences. The third uh, lesson that we learned is something that I personally learned when I started teaching at the College of Southern Nevada, and that is how to provide excellent customer service to your students. Because you know, at, at FAU, we have seven, nearly 700 students, I may receive 50 to 100 student emails a week. Okay? And I would say a third to a half of them are unnecessary. <laughs> when is the next exam? When is, what's my grade in the course? It's, you know, do we have class on Wednesday? There are all these things that are in the syllabus, in my announcements, and they're unnecessary. But, and so you have this temptation to just ignore it or send a one sentence, look in the syllabus, it's there. You know, you, you, you're kind of like annoyed by these emails. But then I started thinking, you know, put yourself in the other side. You know, put yourself in the student's perspective. Or, or think about it this way. This is a good analogy. Uh, how often do you read every email that comes from your dean's office, the provost's office from the university with all these deadlines for grants, deadlines to submit your syllabus and so forth? So often we're not always paying attention to what's going on in the emails that were sent to us. So when you send your office manager an email, uh, hey, uh, I'm, I'm applying for a grant, uh, when, is the, when is the deadline? Imagine how you would feel if the office manager says, look on the website, it's there. You know? <laughs> Because often when we're responding to students, that's what we're kind of doing, right? We're saying we're not answering their question. We're telling them it's, it's somewhere else and they should look it up themselves. So that really led me to really think about, you know, how do you provide better customer service to your students? So here's an example. You get, a, you get an email. When is the next exam? All right. So the answer is in the syllabus. It's in my announcements. It's in Canvas. It's in, uh, in class. <laughs> Only a student who is not engaged at all would ask that type of question. Okay, so how do you respond? I call this response zero because you don't respond at all, right? It's not worth your time. They should have known better. They'll, they'll eventually figure it out once they look elsewhere. The problem with that is how, you know, every time you write an email asking for something to a journal editor, to, you know, a business to complain about something, how do you feel when you get no response, right? So that's like sure bet when you ignore a student's email that you're going to get a pretty lousy evaluation at the end of the semester because you're not being responsive at all, okay? So that's not the ideal response. Response number one, look in the syllabus. Very easy response. Again, put yourself in the student's perspective. You know, you're, to them, they're asking an innocent question, and instead you're getting a response that you're being reprimanded for wasting the professor's time. So again, not the best impression that you would have of your professor. Response number two, October 14th, okay? So you just directly answer the question, nothing else, quick two-second response. Students would be perfectly fine with that in, mo in most cases, right? Because they're getting the answer that they're, get, they're, they're asking for. But it doesn't correct the behavior that led to that email to begin with. So guess what? You're going to get every next exam, you're going to get constant more and more emails of this sort. So really, what uh, I'm as very guilty of all of these type of responses in the past but what I've discovered is, uh, especially now teaching to many uh, non-traditional age students at the community college level, is that uh, like older students, they don't like to be talked to like their 18-year-old freshmen. Uh, in fact, 18-year-old freshmen don't like to be talked to as if they're 18-year-old freshmen. So, so the, the approach that I take now is a little bit longer, but I force myself to, first of all, when I respond, I answer the question. Okay, the exam is October 14th. Then I add a sentence to correct the behavior. Okay, this information along with all future exam dates are in the syllabus, so just look there. And then, this is the, this is the best part. Every response to a, to a student email, you either start or end with a compliment. Okay, thank them for taking the class, congratulate them for doing better on the exam this time than last time. Just do some sort of compliment to your student. And what the most remarkable result is that even students who fail my class, they often end up blaming themselves instead of the professor. Because how can you blame someone who's like really nice to you all the time <laughs> and always encouraging and all that? So, so taking a 30-second a response instead of the five-second response 
can, it takes more time, but it really, I've found over the years, it really has led to a much better reaction from students and better evaluations, okay? All right, my, uh, my last two examples, the fourth one, they're very quick. Uh, the fourth one is to provide regular feedback with your students. And again, this is much easier to do in a small class than in a, in a very large class. But first of all, like I send weekly, e weekly emails every week. Even if I have class regularly, I still send a Monday morning email summarizing the week's activities. It gets them uh, aware of what's coming up. Uh, at least at my uh, Florida Atlantic University, it's required that we send progress reports halfway through the semester. That might be the case uh, for some of your schools as well, where halfway through the term, we have to formally submit their current grade. So that gives them a, an idea if they should perhaps drop the course or, or you know, seek more advising, for example. So most LMS systems allow you to do that very easily. It's, it has a midterm link. You can submit a grade and make that a, a formal communication of their progress. But what many, uh, what I sort of discovered recently and not uh, something I haven't done much in the past is send targeted emails to subsets of your students based on their progress. Okay, so for example, we use Canvas at, at all of our schools. So in, if you use Canvas, in the grade book, you can select any grade column, the three dots next to the, next to the uh, title of the assignment, and you can message specific students who perform, for example, above a certain score or below a certain score. So you can send a targeted message to those who are maybe struggling in the class. And if you use the Canvas's new analytics tool, which launched last fall, it allows you to narrow that search even more. You can now send targeted messages to those within a certain range of performance in your class. So for example, you may wanna send a message to those who are passing your class, but barely, uh, a different message to those who are failing your class, but still have a chance to pass, and then a different message altogether to those who are so far behind that you're really encouraging them to you know, retake the course next semester and save your GPA, okay? So those tools are very valuable to uh, be able to, to send direct feedback messages to a group of students, especially when you have hundreds and hundreds of students without having to send individual messages. Uh, my last lesson learned, and this is my favorite one, is uh, incentivizing students to write better emails to you. Because as I said with lesson three, getting receiving 50 to 100 emails a week, many of them are very cryptic, right? The subject line doesn't have the name of the course, so I don't know which section they're in. Uh, some even use their personal email address, so I don't even know what their name is if they don't sign the letter. Uh, it's, it's very frustrating. Right? And of course, students have a habit of just using text-style writing. So the solution to that is every class that I teach in the first day of class, I spend about two or three minutes showing these exact slides that I'm going to show you. Okay? So it's, I show a communication slide, how to communicate with your professors to your benefit. And I mentioned that this is not my ego or it's not me. This is something that you should be getting to have it for all of your professors. So the way I started is like I show real emails from my previous semester, okay? This is a real email from April 22nd sent by a student. Can I keep my Microsoft Word note while taking exam? Cause I typed my notes on it. And I, I point out the problems with this email, okay? The subject line doesn't have the course name. So I don't know which section they're in easily. Uh, there's no greeting, there's no punctuation, or maybe one little one little punctuation, but it's just not a very well thought out message, okay? Here's another one. Again, subject is very vague, no greeting, no uh, signature. Uh, right now, I'm finally bad, I need to pass this class this semester. I kind of get what they're saying, but it's not very precise, right? <laughs> so here's the punchline, okay? I show these two messages to my students, and I said, what if your professor uses the same effort down the road writing your recommendation letters. <laughs> Imagine asking your professor for a, le a letter to, for a scholarship or for a job or for graduate school. Imagine if I spent about the same amount of time writing their letters as they spent writing to me. <laughs> and like all of you, you get a nice laugh from that slide, but then they get it. They get it, right? They understand that, okay, if I spend a little more time showing respect, writing nice emails, I might get the favor in return, okay? So I conclude this little demo by showing real emails again that are very nicely written, okay? So look, the subject line has the name of the course. It has a greeting, it has sentences, it has punctuation, it has a, a name at the bottom, 
Okay. Here's another one where maybe they don't know the exact course code that they're in, but they say micro. Good enough for me. You know, I teach a micro course, I teach a macro course. If you just say micro, I know exactly what section you're in. Okay. So, uh, so the most remarkable, uh, you know, cost benefit of this is I spend two to three minutes talking about this on the first day of class, but the vast majority of emails I now receive are very nicely written. <laughs>